So I'm going to read a, a story from the book. The idea of the book is it, uh, it tells the sort of founding stories for the songs, and it comes with a code for the music. And so the idea is you would read the story and then listen to the corresponding song. So what I'll do is I'm going to read you a story, and then I'll play you the song. And then we'll have intermission. And apparently I'm going to play some more during intermission, but you don't have to listen. <laughs> you have to listen now. Uh, so the story I'm going to read is it's sort of about two different days, much like Jesse, not exactly. Um, it's called Empty Tank Denial. The song I'll play is called Parachute. Um, and I, I start the story by talking about my philosophy of gas tank management, uh, which, which basically is that I believe that the perfect tank of gas is one in which you coast in to refuel. I can't explain why I feel that way. And then I tell two of the several stories in which I didn't actually make it to the pump. So, um, a few years ago I convinced Sarah, who's my wife, who's sitting over there, to come with me to a gig in Nashville. It was late spring and Sarah was four months pregnant with Jackson. She wore sandals and a sundress and looked beautiful sitting in the passenger seat, her growing round belly poking out between the seat belts. We were coming up from Atlanta and the fuel indicator went on near the lakes around Chattanooga. There were trucks roaring by on both sides and Sarah had been nagging me to fill up for a couple of exits. It was the first time I had really felt it. The gas pedal went down easier than normal. All the way down, in fact, but the car didn't respond. A little bit, maybe, there was a wheeze and a slight push forward, but it definitely did not feel normal. We were in the center lane on I-24. There was barely a shoulder. I think we're out of gas, I said, flat and calm, as if I had little to do with it. <laughs> You've got to be fucking kidding me, Sarah Barker. Not the least bit calm. The steering wheel became pretty tight, but I managed to get us into the right lane and then onto the shoulder. Not the easiest thing to do as you're rapidly decelerating in other cars or not. No, out of gas, empty. I tried to sound unconcerned, almost sweet. I made a zero with my finger and thumb, smiled, and then I reached out for her hand, a move that I can now admit was inappropriate. It's impressive how quickly a coasting car will slow to a stop when there is even the slightest uphill. It shows you how important the gasoline engine really is in propelling a vehicle. I was trying hard to make as little of the situation as possible. It's fine, it's fine, I'll just run up to the exit, I said with confidence as we inched to a stop in the car wide shoulder. You stay right here, be right back. Sarah was furious. You crazy, she yelled over the roar of the traffic. I'm not staying here. We're on a fucking highway. <laughs> she was right. The shoulder was tiny. Trucks were everywhere. What the hell was I thinking? Although I could see the exit just a bend up the road, highways were not designed for the common pedestrian. A half mile can feel really far when cars are blowing by you at 80 miles per hour and your wife is pregnant and pissed. I kept trying to put my arm around her shoulder to pull her toward me. Not happening. I also kept trying to convince her the gas station would be a lot closer if we took the hypotenuse across the field down the embankment to our right. But Sarah didn't like how it looked. It was a good decision. After maybe a minute of walking, a beat up Buick took pity on us and pulled over. Y'all need some help? A lady hollered back at us, her head poking off from the passenger side window. Her southern drawl was basically unintelligible. You ran out of gas, Sarah shouted back, waving the thumb in my direction. It was true. It was my fault, not ours collectively. Still, the third person pronoun stung a little. <laughs> Y'all hop in, we're getting off anyway, the lady yelled. We squeezed in bes beside two extremely large children of undeterminable ages. <laughs> I remember accents so southern and strong that there was little point trying to talk. And I also remember that Sarah, who isn't normally very talkative among strangers, couldn't wait to chat it up with them, as if after driving for two hours with me, she finally felt she was among people she could relate to. <laughs> This wasn't his first time, you know, Sarah announced immediately as I closed the door. He's always almost running out of gas. The entire few minute drive involved them collectively ridiculing me and suggesting that Sarah would be better off making her way alone in the world or staying and raising our baby with them. Luckily, she didn't agree to either proposition and we both got out of the back seat of the Exxon, thanking them warmly. I bought a jerry can, put in a gallon or so, and we began our trek back to the car. This time, the temptation to cut across the Wendy's parking lot and out across the field was too strong even for Sarah. We set off. It seemed like a good idea for the first five minutes or so. The grass was long, and there was a strange and unique post-industrial American beauty to the scene. And there we were, holding hands now, as Sarah had finally begun to soften, smile a little, and let me back in, walking across this oddly empty expanse of unused grassland, 
a vintage leather handbag in her other hand, a red plastic jug of fuel in mine. This postmodern column ended when the field started to get a bit wet. Marshy is a word one might use. The marsh quickly turned to bog, and the bog became more or less like a sunken swamp. At first we figured it was just going to be a couple of puddles, a wet patch. You figure something like that will dry up, so we forged ahead. But then, before we knew it, we were in deep enough that it was really unpleasant. We were too far in to turn back. Needless to say, Sarah dropped my hand. She slogged on ahead. Who knew what it was we were walking through? <laughs> Up until that moment in Sarah's pregnancy, I had been worried about anything and everything she breathed, anything she put in her mouth, anything that touched her skin, went into her hair. Now I had led her into the runoff from a major interstate, a few fast food restaurants, a couple gas stations, and Lord knows what other kinds of crap. When we came to the base of a hill above which was the highway in our waiting car, the land began to dry out. Thank God I shouted up at Sarah. She didn't even respond. <laughs> She was waiting for me, arms at the hips, looking off toward the hill and sort of shaking her head. There's a freaking fence here, she screamed. <laughs> it was low enough to scale, but there was this small strip of barbed wire curling on top. It was just barely barbed, but it was barbed. Should we go back? I asked nervously. She said, hell no, and without hesitation, chucked her sandals and bag onto the other side, then up and over. Man, I was in love with her. <laughs> Took me quite a bit more maneuvering, but we both made it without scratches or cuts. We put in enough gas to get us back to the Exxon, and then we filled up the proper way. We washed all the muck off our legs in the restroom and drove the rest of the way to Nashville in silence. <laughs> a couple years went by without incident. Jackson was born. We moved to New York, then we moved to Corsica. Eventually moved here, but that hadn't happened yet. Upon returning to America, we purchased a used fuel efficient hybrid vehicle, a Prius. It has a computer screen that tells your average mileage per gallon and also gauges what you're getting at the moment. You can watch the bar drop as you rev the engine and see it roar, soar to 100 miles per gallon when you coast down a hill. For the first few months driving the car, I was obsessed with the screen. It changed the way I drove. I no longer hurried anywhere. I drove a lot slower. I took my foot off the gas, using gravity whenever possible. I looked condescendingly on drivers who honked and cut me off. <laughs> I certainly looked condescendingly at drivers of big SUVs. I wasn't necessarily a safer driver, just a slower, more self-righteous one. <laughs> my habits pissed everybody off who drove with me. Feels like we're in a golf cart, my trumpet player Jordan would say. I'd ignore him going on and on about my mileage while we rolled comfortably and quietly toward whatever gig we were heading to. My driving eventually returned to normal, and as it did, I found that my empty tank denial was still strong. In fact, it was perhaps stronger. In the Prius, it seemed literally impossible to run out of gas. I got almost 50 miles to the gallon on a good day, as the computer told me everything. I could estimate how much gas I had left with near pinpoint accuracy. Because of this technology, when George and I were en route to a show in Memphis, I knew we could make it another 10 miles to refuel at the exit that had a Panera. I ignored his advice at each of the prior three exits to get gas. I don't regret waiting until the Panera exit. What I do regret, however, was that I didn't pull right into the gas station when we got off. I insisted we eat first. When we got back into the car and I pressed the ignition button, a red triangle with an exclamation point lit up. I hadn't seen that one before, so I just ignored it and pulled back out toward the gas station. We made it maybe 30, 40 feet down the road, and then the gas pedal had that familiar lightness. I knew the feeling. You don't forget it. I turned to Jordan. Empty, I said, as nonchalantly as possible. <laughs> the look Jordan gave me was different than Sarah's had been when I told her we ran out of gas. There was still some love behind Sarah's glare, if very deep. Maybe it said, I can't believe I married you, but it still said somewhere, this is the man I married. <laughs> Jordan's was simpler, something like, you are a stupid man. <laughs> Yeah, I've seen the Trump three years of touring together seem to negate any impression made by long, late-night conversations on the road. He just shook his head, decided my brain was pea-sized, my skill set non-existent. As I set off on foot across the I-20 overpass to purchase three bucks of gas and yet another red jug, I had to admit he was kind of right. Standing at a gas pump without a car beside you is an inherently shameful experience. <laughs> It's like walking up to a takeout window at a Taco Bell. People look at you funny. You feel the need to explain, to qualify. Somehow I didn't learn this lesson the first time, but if you're filling up a jerry can with gas, you should do at least two things. At least one of two things, and you might as well do both. One, don't pull back fully on the pump throttle. Two, be sure the spout is pointing away from you. I didn't either. So the gas charged into the can, and then immediately the gas charged right back out of the can and exploded out of the spout and sprayed me squarely and strongly in the face. The sting was instant and impressive. I screamed. 
thought I had been blinded. <laughs> Jerry can still in hand, gasoline dripping off my face. My first instinct was to grope blindly for the eyewash station. <laughs> that squirt bottle by the door in every high school chemistry lab. Then I thought about dumping the dirty bucket of windshield wa washer water over my burning head. <laughs> Instead, I dropped the can, and with eyes squinted shut, barely able to see it all, I staggered into the station. Bathroom, I muttered as I got, <laughs> as I got inside. Then I hollered again, bathroom! <laughs> I was quickly grabbed by the arm and led to a sink, no questions asked. Had this happened enough times that the VP had established a protocol? <laughs> the faucet was turned on for me, and then I was left alone. I splashed water on my face for maybe five solid minutes, cursing and moaning until most of the sting was out, and I could cautiously open my tight and closed eyes. Blurry light came in, not blind. Thank God. I gathered myself together, my face feeling really strange, my clothes absolutely soaked, and retrieved the can I had dropped. Somewhat nauseous from the fumes and the heat, I again tried to get a gallon of gas, this time pulling up ever so gingerly on the handle, holding the container at arm's length, and pointing the spout far away from my face. I still flinched as the gas went in. Then I walked back to the car to find Jordan, leaning on the hood, calling all the people in my life whose numbers he had. Sarah first, who wasn't at all surprised. <laughs> and my manager, my agent, mutual friends, he was suggesting that they all reevaluate their opinions of me and stop talking about anything important. I began filling the tank. SUVs and truck drivers honked and laughed. One guy flipped me off. Jordan just grinned at me and shook his head. My eyes were puffy, my cheeks were tingling, my clothes were wrecked, and we were now going to miss our sound check. As I stripped off my shirt and considered throwing it out the window, Jordan sparked up a bowl and nearly lit my body in a full vehicle. <laughs> it would almost have been fitting. For the most part, I learned my lesson, if a little late. I haven't run out of gas since. But I'm still obsessed with what can happen when there is an unforeseen break in the norm and we're thrust suddenly out of the ordinary. It's one reason I like songwriting. You can change a detail or two and create something romantic out of something that might just be a really big pain in the ass. But I don't think that sort of romance is only possible in fiction, and maybe that's why I still don't see the refuel indicator in as urgent a light as I should. I can't seem to quite kick the curiosity of the unknown, wondering if we'll make it to the next exit, and if we don't, what will await us on the side of the road. So I should warn you, this song is only very loosely based on that story. <laughs> Some of the other songs are tied more tightly. Thank you. 